I've been a father for about nine years now. And the thing I've learned about parenthood is it's all about making thousands of decisions for our children in the hopes that the culmination of those choices results in happy, healthy, and smart kids. Well, back in 2011, my wife and I were faced with the monumental decision regarding our four-year-old son, Nate, where he would attend kindergarten. <laughs> Fortunate for us, there was an elementary school just up the street from our house, so I thought that was the obvious choice. My son would start his academic career at the neighborhood school, just like I did. But then we read about a new kind of school that was just being created called the Environmental School Project. It was this outdoor school that sounded a little unorthodox to me. So after discussing it at length with my wife and doing some research, I finally said, no way. It was just too different from what I associated as being a school. I wanted my son to go to a school with a, a building and desks and chairs where his intellect, physical ability, and capacity to memorize facts would be judged against his peers. <laughs> I wanted him to have the same educational experience I had, the same boring, tedious, and stressful experience I had. Perhaps it was reflecting on my own school experience that made me reconsider. But it wasn't until we enrolled Nate in the environmental school, and I spent the first week there, that my whole idea of what a school should look like changed. The environmental school is a kindergarten to grade seven public school located out in Maple Ridge, British Columbia. And it focuses on the pedagogies of experiential, place-based, and ecological education. It has no school building, no desks, no chairs, no letter grades on report cards, no textbooks, no tests, not even any homework. The best way I can describe the school is if you were to take all the metaphors of the conventional school and reimagine them by putting the student at the center of each construct, you would end up with the environmental school. Today's conventional educational system is based on a model of teaching than testing. And while that may work for some students, in my opinion, it simply doesn't work for the majority of kids. The problem is, too much teaching is done out of textbooks. The experience to learning is missing. People learn really well through experience. From the beginning of human history, we've learned what to eat, touch, smell, and run from based on experience. And guess what? It stuck with us. It stuck with us so well that our brains evolved and develop instincts to give us a fighting chance in a world that wants to break, poison, or eat us. So if you know that people learn better through experience, why then do schools look the way they do? Well, they are efficient, in that you can cram 30 kids into a classroom where they can all hear and see the lessons, lessons that are often taught out of textbooks, textbooks that may be inaccurate, or even outdated. Because the textbooks and classrooms are separated from experiences, the learning or lessons become simple rote exercises, and the learning less meaningful. <coughs> For the first couple of years, I was able to spend a considerable amount of time at the environmental school. And as a documentary filmmaker, I brought my camera along and started to record our experiences from day one. It was through my own exploration of the school that I was able to answer a lot of the questions that made me skeptical in the first place. And the thing I let go of immediately, or I should say over time, I began to connect the dots between what looked like simple, fun activities and the deep learning that was emerging through the experiential education the kids were getting. We spent the um, 
first couple of months of school in a beautiful park located next to a river. And the thing I let go of immediately was the whole idea that you know, they weren't in a classroom sitting in chairs. Being out in the natural world provides a space that's filled with stimuli. But at the same time, it's relaxing. You know, whether it's the smell of the cedars or the sound of the river. The overall beauty of the place we're in proved to me to be an amazing place to learn in because it just calmed everyone down. Having a river in their learning environment means the kids are able to witness the salmon spawning cycle, something that all grade schoolers in British Columbia learn about, and usually from a textbook. The difference at the environmental school is that the students are able to stand on the river and watch this, the, uh, the event unfold right in front of them. So when the salmon spawn and die, as they do, the kids can pull the dead fish up onto the land and dissect them. These are elementary school kids with scalpels dissecting fish, <laughs> a lesson typically reserved for high school students. And they're so engaged by the salmon dissection experience that they don't realize they're actually participating in an advanced biology lesson, nor do they need a textbook to show them the anatomy of a fish, especially when they can hold the organs in their hands. <laughs> Weaved into the fish dissection lessons are discussions around the importance of the salmon to British Columbia and the need to protect the spawning grounds. The younger students make art projects with the fish, and they're all able to witness how other animals feed off the dead fish. And the whole animal life cycle is studied firsthand. So yes, the forest is an amazing place to learn the science of biology. But, and this is the question that comes up most often, what about math? <laughs> Surely to God, you can't have a math lesson without a classroom and textbooks. I was never fond of math class when I was young. It always seemed like this abstract concept that was rarely called upon. And that's because there's never any connection made between math and my world. The experience of the math was missing. Well, fortunate for these kids, nature is full of math. And one day I was filming down by the river, and the students were all talking about how fast the water is moving, but they didn't have the numbers to express exactly how fast. So the opportunity presented itself. And then the teachers uh, discussed with the students ways around figuring out the velocity of the river. They ended up handing out tape measures, and the students measured 10 meters along the shoreline. And they found sticks and pine cones and threw them into the water and timed how long it took them to float the 10 meters. They averaged out the results, they converted kilometers per hour, and came up with an answer. A whole lot of math was experienced in those few hours playing down by the river. For the younger students, a math class can be examining the patterns in nature, learning about spheres by building a snowman, or constructing symmetrical sandcastles on a beach. It's not hard to see the math in these activities. And the best part is, most of the time, the kids don't even realize they're learning math. And that's the beauty of how organic experiential education can be. At the environmental school, there is no bell that rings any kids from class to class. There isn't a proclamation of the subject that they're going to be studying, nor is there the rigid division of disciplines. Any given experience can include a multitude of subject areas. Math, science, language arts, history can all be incorporated into one carefully thought out experience. As I continued my exploration of the environmental school, I became curious about their social development and what that would look like in this unique learning environment. One memory I have of school is how you know, we're all divided into grades. And even when I was in grade seven, when I was in a seven-eight split class, I was never friends with anyone in grade eight. That was unheard of. Most of us just stuck with our peers and were all expected to learn at the same rate. 
At the environmental school, the students are divided into multi-age groupings. And then, as needed, they can be broken into groups based more on ability than age. The structure allows for the weaving of students from experience to experience based on the needs of the individual child. The multi-age groupings also foster strong bonds between the students. I've seen grade seven boys caring for kindergarten kids that is hard to believe unless you see it. The compassion shown between the students, regardless of age, is simply inspiring. The older kids mentor the younger kids, which is a huge opportunity. It not only gives the younger child a safe big kid to work with and confide in, but it provides a tremendous confidence building opportunity for the older student. And by teaching what they've learned, they reinforce that knowledge in themselves. Place-based education is another one of the pedagogies of the school. And it's simply taking advantage of the learning opportunities that different locations in our environment have to offer. It's also learning the histories and knowledge of the place itself, where the place becomes the educator. One reason why I think textbooks are so important to the conventional school system is because we stick kids in sterile classrooms that are devoid of context, rather than letting them have direct experiences outdoors and in place. The crayfish, by the way. <laughs> the environmental school does spend many months in forested parks, but they can take advantage of a hydro dam when they want to experience electricity, or a BMX track when they want to experience math and physics. The BMX track is one of my favorite examples of what place-based experiential le education looks like. For a few weeks, all the kids bring their bikes to a local track. And not only does the ability to ride open up the boundaries of the classroom, but the bikes themselves become tools for learning. For example, all the students know they have gears on their bikes that make it harder or easier for them to pedal around the track. Most of them don't actually know why that is. So they experimented, experimented with counted, counting the individual teeth on all the gears, then comparing the ratios between the front and back gears, then riding around the track in each gear setting and observing the results. I don't know how you learn about ratios in school, but I can tell you that my experience is not nearly as fun or meaningful to how these kids learn it. Being out in the forest allows for the activity of fort building, and they spend a lot of time building forts. It teaches all different kinds of lashing techniques, construction design, the proper use of tools, including saws, hammers, measuring tapes, and pocket knives. I'm pretty sure this is one of the few schools that allow students to carry around knives. <laughs> <clears throat> one day I was out filming in the forest and watching the students construct this amazing community of, of forts. And something curious began to happen. Some of the students recognized that certain items, like twine and straight sticks, were in short supply. So the young entrepreneurs turned their forts into stores, and they began bartering with each other. <laughs> Others set up family groupings. Some saw small trees and plants were getting trampled, so they set up conservation areas. And then they set up a system of government, which, despite being a dictatorship, <laughs> was pretty incredible to witness because it all evolved without too much interaction from the teachers. It's just another example of the multitude of learning opportunities that can exist when you have the right place and, allow, and you allow enough space to let the learning happen. Ecological education is another one of the fundamentals of the school. And like the other pedagogies, its purpose is multifaceted. From what I've witnessed, ecological education is learning about our relationship with the natural world. You know, every day we're witness to undeniable climate change and dwindling natural resources, which makes understanding the natural world fundamental to future generations. So it's pretty obvious to me that ecological education should be a focus 
of our education system. Coupled with place-based education, ecological education surrounds the students with nature. And by uh, interacting with the natural world on a daily basis, they develop a strong, positive relationship with it that will hopefully stay with them straight through to adulthood when they become the leaders and decision makers of our world. Through our exploration of the environmental school, we've been able to connect many of the dots to creating a better learning environment. But that doesn't mean we have the complete picture yet. And the only way we will is to, by continuing to challenge the conventional school system, never forgetting what's at stake. Not all schools can look exactly like the environmental school, but if you create a learning environment that's based on meaningful experiences and puts the needs of the child first, then you're on the right track. My daughter, Charlotte, is now four years old and will start kindergarten next year. This time, our decision on where she'll go to school is pretty obvious to us. And as you can see, she's already preparing for her outdoor education. Thank you. <laughs>